Well, hello there. I am High Inquisitive Ventress of the King's Citadel. I've taken some time from my busy schedule administrating justice in order to welcome and thank you for listening to the Dragon Between podcast, a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons campaign set in the Eberron pulp fantasy setting by the lovely Keith Baker. New episodes are recorded every Sunday and released on the following week. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel for clips and future episodes, and do remember to give us a like if you'd be so kind. I would hate to have to send the city guard after you. Joking, of course. Or am I? Do follow us on Facebook and Twitter for updates and news on the podcast. Now that you'll excuse me, there's a certain half-elf cleric that I need to spy on. When we last met, the group had completed the test of Orion, besting aberrant creatures they had never encountered before. After receiving their special signet rings, the group decided to head to Samael's order to check in. Upon arriving back at Sovereign Towers, the party had a brief encounter with the Knights of the Silver Flame. Yathana Moore accused Samael and his companions of being doppelgangers, and it took some convincing to keep the group from getting into a deadly fight. While the majority of the group headed into the cathedral, Nicholas and Zara slipped away to possibly head to the Inquisitor's office or seek out Zara's brother. After a few moments, a child fell hundreds of feet from the district above and impacted the ground, laying in a bloody mess at the brink of death. The child was saved with a combination of Zara's healing ability and a healer from the Silver Flame who then took the child away. The couple then decided to investigate this incident further and headed towards a lift to ascend to the upper district. The rest of the group finished their business at the cathedral and began to head back to the manor after their meeting with Linda Wrighton. Samael had an encounter with Bryn, the character shifter friend, who informed Samael that he had found purpose with the followers of the White, an outreach group that has been helping the displaced and destitute here in Sharn. After some pleasantries, the group boarded Mr. R's sky carriage and headed off. The young mage caught Byron up on some current events, and the party enjoyed a safe ride back to the manor. Nicholas and Zara completed their ascension to the district above and began heading towards a bridge shrouded in fog. It was then that the group were attacked by Nimblereich Bounty Hunter and its arcane drones. The battle was fierce, but the couple were clearly outmatched. The noble right then knocked both of the adventurers unconscious. Back in Cliffside, the characters finally arrived at the manor. The party observed their noble friend, Renair, directing workers milling about the courtyard in front of the property. The group then headed inside the manor for some much-needed relaxation and drink. Byron caught up with Renair and invited him up to the dining chamber upstairs. Once there, a mysterious archdruid revealed himself to the party holding the white cat from Ooze's bookstore. The elven man identified himself as Quimness of the gatekeepers and informed the group that he hadn't met yet, yet met him, but he knew all of them. The druid then shared with Samael that the paladin had shared thoughts on the nature of good and evil on his deathbed, much to the surprise of the attended. A foggy-headed Nicholas and Zara came to in a warm-lit office, strapped to plush chairs. After having cloth wrappings removed from their heads, the couple found themselves seated before an elven woman, wearing strange vestments and flanked by city guards. The woman regarded the couple with malice, and questioned the cleric on her relationship to Nicholas. She then revealed to the couple that they had been brought to the citadel at her request. The rogue soon realizing that he and his wife were seated within the chamber of the High Inquisitor. The mysterious one, the crackle of the fire within the warm lit chamber was after such a long time and so many trials and fights a well deserved area to rest. Seated around the long table the members of this group of mercenaries sat staring at this newcomer, quizzical looks on their faces as the man stared across the table towards Samael, 
regarding him. The white cat began pacing now down the table, stopping to look in each one of the chalices spaced between each of the members of the group sat at the table, looking in each and regarding each with some bit of disdain, about as much as you can gather from the facial features of a feline creature. It would then look up to each of you and then look back towards the elven man seated at the far end of the table and then sat down on its haunches, expectantly waiting. I'm sure you're all confused. I apologize for that. It was not in my intention to confuse any of you. It's my only my intention to be of help. I will answer any questions that you have. Um, well, you kind of call a set of sorts. Um, why are you here and what is it you want? I am here because I must be here. And there you go, being cryptic again. I apologize. Did they teach y'all how to do that? You have to understand, Samael. I took a great risk coming here. And it is sacrilege to my order to even be here amongst you now. Well, the deed is done. Well, let's see why you're here. I told you my name. That is as much. I am Quimnus of the Gatekeepers. And I am from an alternate timeline. I am from what you would consider your future. Sometime in the future, you will meet my self and my companions at the sanctuary and we will watch the world burn together now I just fuck your forging limit okay seriously though what is your motive for coming here now I am here to prepare you the timeline has already been altered by meeting you now. I'm here to prepare you for a great calamity that will befall Eberron. I have a feeling that it has something to do with a dimensional seal that was broken in the bizarre district a month ago. Yeah, we did that. Exactly how far from the future are you? Well, that is uh, is approximately fifty years. Fifty years. Yes. What? It is the year one thousand. Is it not? Is it year 1000? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Then yes, 50 years from now. That is... That is when the Chrono Forge was completed and I was able to use the power of the Forge to travel to this timeline. Well, that seal has already been broken, so what can we do to change this now? I must begin finding possible locations for other dimensional seals. Got any leads? I only know that the convergence, which is what was what the calamity was called, were the result of the dimensional seals being broken one by one. 
and Eberron was slowly pulled into the realm of madness, a chunk of it at a time. The remaining... Um, yes, go ahead. Um, if you traveled through time, why didn't you come a month earlier and prevent us from opening up, you know? Unfortunately, the Chronoforge was the first of its kind. And we did not know just how far back it would send us. I arrived shortly after you. I apologize. One of you broke the first seal. Dick. <coughs> Unfortunately, the trip is one way. And the act of coming to this alternate timeline means that I would not have any means of traveling back to my timeline even if I wanted to. So if you say that we broke one of the seals, how many more seals are there? That I don't know. That I wish to discover as quickly as I can. Do you know if this is related to that fog that's impenetrating the city right now? If you're referring to the mist, the mist is unnatural. It is not of what you would normally see this in, during the spring. Sure, there's rain, sure, there's fog, but this sort of fog is, can only be that generated from something. Yes, but that Being. doesn't tell me if it's related. Do you know if it is? I do not, unfortunately. I just know that it is typically something of this nature is, can, if it is not magical, it is generated from a creature. Okay, what about the uh, martyrs in the lower wards? Have you heard of those? I have. Do you think they're related as well? It is possible. It, I have heard rumors that the the symbol that was left behind by I believe the bookstore I don't remember the name of the of the woman who owned it but she died shortly after and oh, damn. her cat came into my possession when I began investigating Okay, well, you've been here and you've done this. Do we have any potential allies around us right now that we can rely on? Of course. There are many allies that you can rely on. But you must understand, I only met you at the end. I met you at the sanctuary. You and your friends are the reason why so many were saved that day. You were instrumental in fending off the hordes and allowing the Ark to travel to the Sanctuary. I understand. And I appreciate that, but we need something to go off of, a direction to go in. I can only tell you that that is why I'm here now, to warn you and to prepare you. And I must immediately begin researching locations for these seals. So right now we're just waiting until you find something out? Keep your ear to the ground, as you once told me, Samuel. Fair enough. I can answer as many questions as I can. But... I must insist that you not ask too many questions about your personal futures. Well, that's not a problem. It's an alternate timeline anyway. Indeed. Yeah, does... Hey, uh, does the cat ever attack Nick in revenge? Didn't oh. he just tell you not to do that? That's not my personal life. Oh, true. Philippa is harmless. For now. That's all you need to know about her. Well, <laughs> if it does, I give it permission as long as it's not fatal. One thing that I can tell you that may aid you in your travels. Very soon, within the next year actually, 
there will be another long war. And the start of the war was, of course, no one really knows the exact reasons for it these times. But it is rumor that is linked to one of the dragon marked houses. One that became militarized and began attacking major settlements. You know which one? I believe it's called House Tarkanen. Anybody recognize that name? Well, you guys have heard the name Tarkanen before. Oh, somehow I forgot. Siegfried, one of his doubles, mentioned it. Called Zara Tarkanen Trash. So you think this house is behind everything? Behind everything? Debatable. Or, I'm, or at least the war, at least. Definitely connected to the war. I, I, many of the scholars at the sanctuary, of course, many records were destroyed with the world sinking into the oblivion of the realm of madness. The source of the war was rumored to have been because of the dragon marked houses another dragon marked house war began instead due to house tarkanen if i may wouldn't putting a whole continent into another realm require a large amount of sacrifices along with magical powers wouldn't it be possible that the war was engineered behind the scenes to get those kind of sacrifices. Well, I don't know about sacrifices, Siegfried. You and I discussed this for many years on the sanctuary, and you brought that very theory up. But the convergence, as it was called, the entire world, towards the end, was dragged into the realm of madness until there was no world left. Sounds crazy. Well, that's what madness is. It was a pun. So basically, we're looking at a war and a world ending scenario. Obviously, we know which one takes precedence. Indeed. Is there anything we can do now? I need time, Samael. Very well. And I think we all should get some sleep and start plotting first thing in the morning. We'll check and see what other information we found from our contacts and see if we can proceed from there. Before. Yes, we do have to wait for Nick and Zara, as well as for responses from the ones that we did send out messages. To. Where are they, by the way? Did, he, did they tell anyone where they're going? No, they're on our honeymoon. Back in there, gone. Hmm. And on that, seems suspect. And on that note, we shall transition to Nicholas and Zara. The office is filled with the smells of old leather and perfume. The elven woman lounges in her chair now, staring across her desk at her former lover. She gives him a burning and knowing look and continues to stare at him. N 
nothing. No words, Nicholas. No, no words. Zara. You're staring at me though. Is this face too pretty for you? Zara looks over at Nick, and she doesn't say anything, but she just gives him a look that's like, why the hell didn't you tell me something? If, if one can have a look like that. Zara, as you look over towards Nicholas, you notice that he is wearing very basic clothing right now. He's not wearing the, tr the standard outfit that he typically wears. Um, and he is also without footwear. I, okay, I immediately look at uh, his fingers and my fingers. Do we still have the rings on? You do, actually. You still have your signet rings, um, if that's what you're referring to. And, like, the, uh, yeah, from the, um, that we got from fighting. From the, the Order of Orion? Yes. Yes. You do have those rings on. Um, Zara, you actually have another ring on your hand as well. One that you are not familiar with. I try to take a closer look at it. You know, make it any symbols or the feeling of... It is... It feels as though it's a size tighter than your normal that you're used to whenever you've worn jewelry. And it seems to have serrated edges on either side of the band. So that if one were to attempt to remove it, it would cut into the finger. Okay, okay. <laughs> the Inquisitor turns and looks at you. And begins speaking to you now. And as she's speaking to you, it almost feels as though her voice is amplified. And you feel a buzzing in your head. And she begins asking you, tell me, child, who is your family? And I need you to make a wisdom save at it with advantage. All right. Here goes. Ah, that's like a. a... Zara, you're normally profound wisdom. You feel that buzzing in your ears increase in intensity now. And you are now struck with this overwhelming sensation that you must tell this person anything and everything. This person which you at, at once you, you felt as though you wanted to strangle the life out of her. You now regard her as a good friend. <laughs> so, Zara High Hill, it was, was it? Uh, no, no, uh, Zara Aisha. Aisha? That's a pretty name. Yes, 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 yes. it's my, uh, my mother's name, actually. My, my father took took my mother's name I, d I don't know why but you know that they're, they're not they're not alive anymore but they were my, they were great parents and my brother Castor and we were a great family and yeah I, I might have told you about it before oh yes it's very interesting Aisha very pretty name not very familiar what family that you said Aisha is connected to where do you oh. hail from? Well, uh, Aisha is actually a, a it's pretty common name in 
from where I'm from, with a, we, we own a business. My, my parents and their siblings, you know, it's a three generations we've owned a weaponry business. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, my, my parents, they were, they, they were a little different than the rest of the family. They didn't want us to start in the business too, too early, but, uh, you know, I was going to go with it. And my mother, she, she ran a lot. Uh, she worked with the weapons dealers a lot and, we all lived in a mansion together, me and my cousins and my uncles and aunts. But, uh, well, uh, she, th they're no longer alive. Oh, that is too bad. Oh, my, my parents, but, but the rest of my family is still there. Oh, and tell me, love, what is the significance of this jewelry? And you now see as she pulls up from the table out of a pile of silk, a very familiar necklace, and holds it up in her hands, and it sparkles in the sunlight streaming from behind her. Well, you know, my mother gave it to me uh, when I was a little girl, and, uh, <laughs> oh, I loved my mother. She was the best. And I think it, her mother had given it to her as well. Um, I don't know. They... They, they pass it along the generation to the person that, I guess, whoever chooses, but I, I don't know. That, that's all I know about it. It's, it's rather pretty. It is. It's very pretty. Hmm. I'm sure that the two of you are curious as to why you're here. Why I have brought you here in the first place, and that is be expected I mentioned before that this was all the gentleman sitting next to you's fault did I not oh Nick oh, I thought we were all friends what are you talking about well you must have forgotten and perhaps I apologize Nicholas and I were an item decades ago and due to some complications within our houses we could no longer see each other exclusively but we promised to stay true to one another and unfortunately for both of you love he broke that promise and that is why you're sitting now before me how does Zara feel right now does she still feel compelled to speak Oh yeah, you you feel like this is the like your best friend. She feels like a sister to you right now, and you still feel that buzzing in your head whenever she speaks. There's this mechanical buzzing. And and uh, Nick and I got married, you know, just a little over a little less than a year ago. We had met at one of the uh, charity events, uh, you know, uh, raising money from the war and rebuilding the city and. But we got married, and yeah. Yes. Interesting. And I think we've had enough pleasantries for a moment. Nicholas and dear Zara. Let us get down to the reason why you're before me now. On your finger and right now, dear Zara, is a cursed ring. The gentleman that is in the cage behind us, and she gestures just over her right shoulder to a gentleman. You see a man wearing vestments that look like he is of the sea or a sailor, and he is his face is a mess, blackened and bruised. And he is currently chained to the wall inside of the cell. It was horrible. This this gentleman, he he came along and he waylaid you on the bridge over in Central Plateau. It was horrible. And then he knocked you out and put this ring on your finger. I'm so very sorry, Zara. Oh, 
you know, apology expected. You know, sometimes things happen. You never know. And Zara, even though this, this, you, you feel compelled to answer questions, it, this just doesn't seem right in your head. This, how she's describing it to you now. It, you are remembering to, you're, you're, she's telling you this, but you're remembering something completely different. You're remembering being ta attacked by a nimble right. Um, is this ring causing any damage to my finger? At the moment, no. And the Inquisitor, High Inquisitor stands up from her desk now and she walks over to the gentleman that's in the cage and she says, notice his right hand wearing an identical ring. And he looks, she looks back to both of you with a bit of a leer on her face now, her eyes wide. Do you see it, Nicholas? Do you see the resemblance to the one on her hand? Nick's not going to say anything. She then immediately pulls a rapier from her side and plunges it into the chest of the man inside of the cell. And he just screams out with a sharp, Hah! and then immediately you watch as his, a flash of green energy arcs out from his hand and travels all along the surface of his skin and he grows cold and his head hangs now and he hangs from the chains lifeless and she looks back and she says to both you and zara the sailor was wearing a band of loyalty it was a particularly nasty item Many criminal organizations use them to prevent their people from being captured. If you happen to fall in battle, unconscious, it will kill you instantly. I am afraid, dear Zara, that you now have this ring on your hand which is quite unremovable through normal means. And there is only one way that you can get that off, that particular one off of your hand. Uh, what what do you mean? It, and she's like struggling now, just trying to struggling against this thing she feels in their head versus what she's seeing in front. And Vivette looks towards the guards and says, "Hold their heads." And they one at a time start begin walking towards you and reach out and grip both your heads so that you're staring straight ahead. And then two more guards walk around and open up chests next to her desk and lift out helmet, a helmet out of two helmets out of it and begin approaching you and begin placing the helmets on top of your heads. I and look at her. I say, you know, this means you die, right? <laughs> oh, Nicholas. We have not completed our demonstration yet. And as the helmet is shoved down on your head, over your heads, Nicholas and Zara, a visor made of crystal begins emanating from the top of the helmet and slides over the front of your face. And the crystal itself is of a shimmery orange, almost yellow variety. And the crystal is somewhat see-through. Can I still see her? Yes, you can. From this day forward, you better sleep with one eye open. Because one day, when you least expect it, I will kill you. Well, that may very well be, Nicholas. I have certainly earned your ire today. However, though I've revealed things to you today, I feel as though I've revealed too much. 
You, of course, remember the MMU. Do you not? Yes. What about it? You have... You have a modified version on your heads at the moment. We use them to rehabilitate dangerous criminal criminals back into soci society. As best we can. And there's information that you both know that simply can't be kept. Therefore, and she begins walking towards the desk and grabs the hat that she took off before and places it on her head. And you both watch as her features begin to mold and shift back into that of the violet makeup face and the long silver hair. Does Zara still feel compelled? Uh, yes, you still feel a bit compelled to answer questions, but it start. It feels like it's starting to fade now, and the panic of of this thing being over your head is starting to set in. Okay. So. After placing the hat back on her head and her features shifting and changing back to that of the woman that you first saw in the chamber, you start to feel a vibration and a bit of queasiness. And you can both feel an energy, a sensation of buildup. And I need you both to make wisdom saves at advantage. All right. A four. Use hero points. Fifteen. Are you going to use hero points, guys? Do you want these hero points? Can, can you only use one? You can only use one. There's, There's no, no way. One per roll. Or, uh, the most I'll give the ten, it's not worth. You know what? Zara's gonna use one just in case. <laughs> uh, it's a d6, right? It is a d6. You can actually roll it right from your character sheet. On the first tab, you'll see an option for hero points. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I see. Cool. Okay. So that is a 20 for you, Zara. So, Zara, you do not feel the sensation of this energy buildup do anything to you. However, Nicholas, unless you're planning on using a hero point... Just use it. Ah, I'll right, use one. I, I, I mean, you don't have to because, to be perfectly honest, it wouldn't help anyway. Eight. <laughs> An eight. So, Nicholas, you are now misremembering. The, the woman speaks to you and she says, Oh, Junior Inquisitor Nicholas, I apologize for this horrible situation that you're in at the moment. And I need you both to make another wisdom save at advantage. Alright. As the energy begins building up more and more. <laughs> A two. <laughs> 25. And the woman begins speaking again and says, I apologize for the, this 
debriefing that I had to bring you in, Junior Inquisitor Nicholas, so quickly. Oh, no worries, ma'am. And then I need you to both cast, or excuse me, uh, both make another wisdom save at advantage. I think Nick should restart because that last one, he rolled a one and a two. You're not there right now, Siegfried. Uh, a 20. Nine. You can use a hero point. Would you like to use a hero point, Nicholas? I'll be honest, it's not going to help. Uh. <laughs> yeah, there's no point. The woman looks at you and says, We caught the gentleman that waylaid you on the bridge. And as you can see, he died while we were interrogating him. And, and the, finally, uh, a man walks up. The man that was holding your head, Zara, lifts the helmet off of your head. But Nicholas, the helmet that is over your head stays. And you can watch as the Inquisitor gets closer to you. She places her hand on the top of the device and begins cranking a dial. And looks you in the eyes and gives you a wink. And I need you to make another wisdom save. At advantage. Come on. Oh, can I? Oh, dang. It's, hey. <laughs> it's funny. Junior Inquisitor Nicholas, I was surprised that you came back to the Citadel after you told me that nearly a month ago you had decided to take another path. That you'd met that wizard from the Lazar Principalities and that he'd gave, given you a spell book. It's so hard. In all the years I knew you, I never thought that you were interested in the arcane arts. I apologize. I, I fear that you lost that spell book in the struggle with the gentleman that fell over the edge of the bridges. Um, our guards, unfortunately, could not find it. Oh, no worries, ma'am. I can always get another one. It's true. I know that you were, were quite adamant that you wanted to deviate from your path and continue to study in, as a novice in the ways of the arcane arts. And she now nods to the guard behind you and the helmet is pulled off of your head. And Nicholas, you feel just this sensation in your head of just this twisting like you're misremembering something you're remembering two things at the same time you're remembering a moment where a griffin appeared before you outside of the shops in redstone and delivered a spell book to you mm. do you need any of my assistance further well yes it's um i know that you only now still getting back to your duties and junior inquisitor nicholas your your poor friend here we must take care of this ring right away um i can only assume that you would want to get that off her hand immediately for i feel uh, that yes. she will most certainly die if not um ma'am do you know how to remove it well i do actually um Oh. The, before the gentleman died from his injuries, uh, we discovered that he was from one of the three ships docked in Cliffside. I believe you might have heard of them. The, the Sea Maiden's Fair. Yes, I have. A man you named... need me to go, ma'am. A man named Zaras Zord. He has a All device right. on his ship. It looks like a model of a manta ray. And is rumored that this is what he uses to remove the rings from his sailors once they've completed their, their time with them. That is the only known way to remove this ring from your friend's hand. You must go and seek out the Zardoz. I must warn you, Zardoz does not treat with or meet with adventurers or even city type. However, he wouldn't say no to having a bit of food and drink if you were to impersonate noble that is i just so happen mm. to have acquired four invitations to his ship 
Oh, uh, oh, great, uh, uh, High Inquisitor. Oh, you know, Nick was having some problems. Uh, apparently, his his uh, his barge had expired. Would you mind, you know, reinstating him so that he could, you oh, know, just. Oh, but of course, I, I've taken the liberty of cleaning all of, having all of your items cleaned and sent to your home. I believe it was in the the manor in Trollskull Alley. Oh yes, yes, that's it. Of course, I I know exactly where it is, and I'll send you there promptly. I feel you'll, even safer, ma'am. You'll find with your things. I will I will have left a note detailing. Um, how to get onto the ship and of course the invitations and everything that we've just thus far and uh, I apologize for the bindings you were both quite delirious when we found you I'm not sure what this gentleman did to both of you um, guards please undo their binds at once oh I'm so sorry ma'am I hope I didn't hurt anybody oh, oh same same uh, thank you for helping us oh it was my pleasure and as your bonds are undone, um, a bit of energy crackles from the chairs. And the room suddenly gets bright white. And the Inquisitor turns and looks at you, Nicholas, and then looks at you, Zara, and winks. And your vision is blinded. And you find yourself standing in the middle of Troll Skull Alley in your underwear. Ah, Nick. Uh, uh, let's get inside. Let's go. Let's go. Come on, come on. She kind of holds him by the hand and leads him toward. Yeah, I, I rush in too. Okay. As you're passing by, you see um, pallets that are covered now with tarps. Uh, men have are now leaving the the yard and they're walking away. And as you pass by, you notice on one side of the manor there is a beautiful mural of an a halfling man standing over the corpse of an ogre. Uh, excuse me, uh, is this being delivered to our manor? What is this? And one of the men t turns around and looks and says, Have you no decency? Where are you clothes, ma'am? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a, a, a bit of a... Someone stole them, so we, we know we're, we're going to inside to get. You better get some clothes on quick before the watch get to you. They'll throw you in the brig. Okay, okay, but uh, if you don't mind me asking, what is this painting doing? Where, where did it come from? Uh, we'll go inside. The man just kind of looks at you, turns his head sideways, his hands on his hips, and just kind of shakes his head and turns around and starts walking away. I'm going to give an awkward wave and let's go inside. Okay, okay, so we run inside and then... Yeah. Um, as you walk inside, you see the familiar side of the manor, which is now um, beautifully restored. You see plush chairs. You see a, a roaring fire in the northern section of the tap room. Um, and you see the spectral image of Lyft behind the... And he looks almost shocked at your, at your, uh, your appearance in the, in the manor. Hi, Lyft. I'm sorry. Uh... Where are the others? Are they here? We like to talk to them. Well, maybe we'd like to get them close. Lyf uh, slowly raises one hand and points an index finger directly above him. Uh, uh, I look up. And he's pointing apparently to the second floor above the tap room. Oh, you mean we have to go outside? Uh, oh, okay, let's hurry up. <laughs> Let's go. So, awkwardly, you, you head around to the outside and take the back way up to the second floor. And as you approach and open the door, you are greeted by the familiar sight of your five friends, Renair, uh, the white cat, <laughs> the white cat on the table, who immediately arches its back and hisses at Nicholas, and a strange man wearing the vestments of a druid. Uh. I'm sorry, guys. This is really awkward. We're back. Uh, we need some clothes. Just uh, we run into. It. Did you guys get mugged? 
Yeah. We did. There was someone on the bridge. They uh, took our clothes. And uh, we're okay right now. Uh, and so she just runs. Okay, Nick, come on. Let's, let's, let's get... And I, think, I think they're lying. Apparently their honeymoon got a little too exciting. Weird. Nick slams the door to the room. Hi Nick, hi Nick. All right, let's uh, let's get some clothes on, and she they find some clothes and put them on. Do we find clothes? Uh, heading back to your chambers, you find a a beautiful box made of dark wood, and inside of the the box you find your belongings, and you find a sealed pentagonal note. I want to look at the note. The note says, Junior Inquisitor Nicholas Highhill, if you value the life of your friend, then you must seek out the model submarine that Sawdust Zord keeps somewhere on his ship, the Eye Catcher. The model resembles a mechanical manta ray. Zord uses this device to remove bands of loyalty from crew members that leave his employ. Your status as a junior inquisitor has been reinstated following your debriefing. And junior is underlined, I might add. You'll find four invitations to a weekly dinner party on the eye catcher enclosed with the letter. You'll need to disguise yourself as nobles if you wish to board the vessel safely. Zord is very a suspicious fellow and distrusts adventurers and mercenaries, but enjoys holding his private dinner parties for members of the Sixty Families. Good luck to you and your friend. Warmest regards, High Inquisitor Ventress. Well, looks like we must do this. Well, uh, let's talk to the group first and, you know, just see what they've been up to. And, uh... If, I'm just glad they caught him. Yes, yes, and if Nick is paying attention, he would realize that Zara's face is completely white, and she is, like, shaking. And Zara, I might add that the effects of that device that was put on your head had absolutely no effect on you. You remember everything. I know. <laughs> So, uh, oh, all right, Nick, let, let's come over here. And she goes out to meet everyone. Oh, hello, guys. Uh, how's it going? And she is, well, like I said, if anyone was paying any sort of attention, they would realize that she is, like, in shock. Right? There is an audible popping noise behind you as you head into the chamber and look at your friends. And... Standing behind you, the group, you now see the resplendent robed form of Manchun. Manchun! Glad you hey. made it. Well, good evening. Oh, I received a message from your friend uh, Siegfried. Said to, yeah, come, said to come at once. Yeah, man, we've got problems, and I believe they're related to that book we gave you. Um, would you mind sitting in and listening at all? Of course, uh, and he begins walking towards one of the chairs and gestures with his um, gauntleted hand. And the chair behind the table moves on its own accord. And he sits down. And he looks, so at, cool. looks at each of you with a warm smile. He turns and he looks at Nicholas and, and, and Zara and says, Oh, you two look like you've had yourselves quite the evening. And that's why I know when to quit drinking. Oh, yes. Oh, hey, Menchun. Yes. Uh, question. Yes, sir. I seem to have lost my spell book. A spell book. Uh, you know, you great wizard and all. Uh, do you have any extras? You know, I just so happen to keep a spare on, on me. At all times, you never know when you need <laughs> uh, to replace one. Uh, oh, I, oh. I am confused, though. Um, I was under the impression that you had no inclination towards the arcane arts. Oh no, I, I met a wizard um, a couple months ago, and uh, I've been studying. I'm no, nothing like you by any means, but, uh, you know, I, I try here and there. 
He just kind of and tilts his head and looks at you. And he just sort of smiles and he says, <laughs> Well, that's uh, no problem at all. I, of course, I'm always at the beck and call of any who would show an interest in the arcane arts, my friend. But I'm going to cast light. Okay. Um, you hold your hand out and nothing happens. I seem to not get the jesters right sometimes. And and Zara looks at him like like the wife like, wait what? What have we been doing? Like, like I did secret... not. Siegfried secretly casts light from the corner to make it look like, to make like, like Nick's doing it. Man, shoot immediately. He begins clapping very very lightly. Oh, that's wonderful. As a, a novice, that's that's wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, I'm a big fan of you. You know, I heard you're an amazing wizard and all. Well, I don't know about amazing. Many study the arcane arts, and not all uh, follow the same path. And Guys, I hate to break this up, but um, Manchun, we are looking at a potential end of the world scenario that we really need to discuss with you. As you say that, Samael, you're glancing around the table. You just see a shell-shocked Linda Wrighton clinging to Byron, just soaking up all this information. I'm going to throw her awake. She uh, just completely does not respond to you in any way. She Oh, I wasn't expecting her to. She slowly turns and looks at Byron with this pained look on her face. What is going on? Yes, I'm wondering the same thing. What is going on? And now Zara looks like just even more <laughs> shell shocked. To be honest with you, I'm getting impatient. Um, Siegfried, would you mind giving them a quick breakdown of this? Well, not that you two being mugged isn't a big deal. I mean, kind of disappointed you lost and got the crap beat out of you. But we were informed that there's some issues with the whole world following to the realm of madness and a war among the houses um, coming about by this gentleman over here that used some means of transportation to travel through time. Kind of how we, you know, use Mr. R to go place to place except through time. The Kronos Forge, I believe it was. And um, yeah, so basically the world may end by falling to the world of madness. We have an upcoming war it's all in um, the next year. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. We already had other questions, just kind of adds questions upon those questions. And just, I think we really should talk about the big things before we go to the small things. And he looks at Nick and then to the cat. And it'll be a fun fight later on. The important thing, though, is that it's all related to that seal that we broke earlier. We think that's going to be the catalyst that starts the entire chain of events, which is why we reached out to Manchun. We need information on these seals, and we need to combine our knowledge and see what we can do to stop this. Sure, sure. I, I understand this. Um, and, you know, we were just mugged. It's not a big deal. And But Zara actually takes some yes, paper out of her, uh, her bag and writes, I need to talk to you guys, but I need someone to make sure that the room is clear of any sort of listening devices, including our bags. And she kind of looks at Manchun. Something happened much more than being mugged. And she wrote it on the piece of paper. And I need to tell you, but I need to make sure that no one is listening. And Manchin Luke looks at you and looks at the paper and nods and raises a hand and, and traces a sigil. And the entire room flashes for a moment. What was that? It's just a simple spell to prevent folks that from listening that shouldn't be listening. I tell you, Manchin, every day I know you is a day that just better is my life. Thanks. Does that count stuff in someone's clothes or body?